So talking about uh, differences in assessments throughout the newborn's hospitalization, really the things to remember are you want to do the weight the same time every day and a lot of times you see that being done on the night shift uh, when things are a little bit quieter moms wanting to rest physicians not being around those types of things also remember safety and heat loss so when you, you look at this picture and you see this newborn lying on the scale you know we want to make sure that they're not laying there too long and uh, getting them warm and then also keeping them safe we're going to be doing a head circumference and when you do the infant's head circumference make sure that uh, you are doing that measurement at um, right above the eyebrows so that you are getting the widest diameter part of their head abdominal circumference typically you do that right above the umbilical cord and that's going to be something that you're going to be seeing documented um, on each uh, on each newborn it's not something with the head circumference and abdominal circumference it's not something you do every shift unless you know that there's some type of abnormality but typically we just want to get an admission um, circumference the weights you will be doing uh, every day and then we'll be watching those if you have a baby that is born in the frank, frank breech position, uh, that means that the feet are up by the head. A lot of times this is what they look like uh, newborn. So when you are assessing them, it's important to remember not to pull those legs down. Um, they will eventually, those uh, muscles will loosen up and the legs will come down. Um, but really just try to keep them in a position of comfort. When we're looking at a post-term infant, when you're looking right here on this infant's abdomen, you can see those white, deep cracks. Um, so the older or further in gestation the infant is, the more likely that you're going to see that type of skin. You cannot see very many vessels. They have a nice layer of brown fat, um, but they just tend to be a bit more wrinkly assessment of the back when you're looking at the infant's back it is going to be real common to see this fine hair also known as um, lanugo you want to make sure that they are intact from the top to the rump um, looking at the anus making sure the anus is present um, once they have their first meconium stool then we can say that it is patent um, but listening to lung sounds both anteriorly and posteriorly Assessment, um, this just shows that lanugo being present right there on the ear and we talked in um, women's health and pregnancy that as they age in gestation that lanugo will tend to thin. Um, it is much more prominent in the African American as well as Hispanic and Native American populations. So um, that's something that you will also be looking at. Immediately after delivery, this is kind of what is normal and what you will be seeing. So at the top of this picture, you can see that there is a bulb suction. So we're going to make sure that we are using a bulb suction to suction their mouth and nose. Um, we're getting ready right here to cut the cord so you can see that that cord clamp is on. The baby is really wet. We have some acrocyanosis on their feet and those things are going to be really normal. So when we have our babies looking like this, we want to make sure that we are warming, drying, stimulating them, changing out those wet linens, putting dry linens on um, and making sure that we maintain their temperature. Jaundice then is just the yellowing of the skin and you can see that in this picture this baby does appear to be quite yellow. If you, the nurse would suspect jaundice, what they can do is do a transcutaneous bilirubin and if it's under 15, Typically, you just using a billy blanket is is what you will be seeing. If it's over than 15, then we might we might see them placed under the um, billy lights. Um, once those billy lights have been started, uh, the transcutaneous billy ribbon is reading is not going to be adequate. So then we're going to have to make sure that we do blood draws on them. Um, we don't do transcutaneous billy ribbons on all babies. Um, it's just ones that we are maybe at higher risk. So if mom has had a baby with jaundice in the past or if the baby isn't feeding well, sleepy, those kinds of things, I uh, want to make sure that we get them into those risk categories and then get that um, bilirubin reading done. 
weighing the infant, just make sure that your scale is zeroed out, that the infant is um, naked, and that you do have that scale uh, lined with some type of protector just so that it's not that cold, um, cold, cold surface meeting up with the baby. When you're looking at a baby that's crying, um, crying is important because it does act like a CPAP to open those alveoli and help clear the lungs. So it's really important for these newborns to cry. So we just reassure the parents and offer some support. Acrocyanosis of the feet, so that's that bluish cyanotic color of their feet. And it's okay to be seeing this um, 24 to 36 hours post delivery and the reason being that we do see acrocyanosis is that they have their microcapillaries aren't as functional and well developed as what you and I have and so it is pretty common to see that for the first day day and a half stork bites are just pink areas you can see right here over each eye and then kind of on the forehead those are pink areas that are blanched easily there's really no clinical significant uh, significance and they will typically fade over time. However, when you are seeing those, um, here's another one, image on the back of a baby's head. When you see those, um, sometimes when the baby cries, they'll become more prominent and that's nothing to worry about at all. It's really common to see them over the eyelids, nose, the upper lip, um, right here as you can see in this picture, the nape of the neck and the low occipital area. The milia are going to be little white spots that you see present across the, the nose and maybe onto the, the um, area under the eyes and those are related to hormonal changes um, after pregnancy from mom's hormones and those are going to be um, just disappear over time. So there's really no uh, clinical significance with those either. And the erythema toxicum is um, sometimes people refer to it as baby acne and it can be anywhere on any part of the baby's body and it's really just an inflammatory response and there's no treatment other than we want to tell the, the parents not to pick at those or pop those or, or mess with them and when you're looking at them especially this picture over here of the baby's backside there are three stages they are macules papules and then as you can see on this foot they turn into small little vesicles and they will eventually um, disappear on their own. Mongolian spots are very common with different ethnicities. The one thing I need to talk about with the Mongolian spot is obviously it's a bluish discoloration. Very prominent, very common to see on um, these infants back, especially by their buttocks. You want to make sure that you get these charted so that if it would ever, if this infant would ever come into the hospital, they know that it's a Mongolian spot and it's not something that happened due to abuse. So that's the one really important thing uh, if you have infants that have Mongolian spots is to get that information documented. Umbilical cord stump, real common to see. You can see on this one that right here we've removed the umbilical cord clamp, that nice yellow clamp that was on an earlier picture. The umbilical cord stump will be dry and hard just like it's um, shown in this picture and what we do for education sometimes we tell people to clean them with alcohol wipes with diaper changes otherwise we just have them leave them open to the air and it will eventually just dry up and fall off it usually falls off between about 10 and 14 days sometimes there can be a little bleeding associated when it um, initially falls off but as long as there's not any profuse, profuse bleeding there's no foul or green drainage anything like that then um, where there's really no, nothing to worry about so in this photo you can see molding and so with molding, you can see that it's the overlapping sutures um, and the reason that molding is important, you can kind of see that cone head right here. And then you can see one of the, with some molding right here with this line that kind of sits right um, on the top part of their forehead. The, the idea behind molding is to help facilitate delivery. Uh, we want to see that molding as the baby is delivered, um, let's, makes passage via the vaginal um, opening much easier. When you're looking at a cephalohematoma, here you can see there's a nice bruise right on the top front part of this baby's um, head. And when you're thinking cephalohematomas, that is blood that is between the skull and its periosteum. And remember from probably very beginning that when you are thinking about cephalohematomas, those do not cross cranial suture lines. And it's very common to see cephalohematomas with a vacuum-assisted delivery. 
You can see that again here, right down the middle, it's not crossing um, that suture line. And those will eventually just uh, reabsorb and go away. Typically takes a little while, you know, takes a couple of days. That molding is usually gone within like 24 to 36 hours. The caput circadian then is the other type of swelling. And you can see if I click to the next picture that there is definite edema and it's typically occurs in the occiput area and the caput circadian is due to compression of the local vessels with decreased venous return and it does um, extend across the sutures and when you're looking at a caput it's very common to see caput's associated with a long labor and that baby has been sitting against that cervix for a very long time and we don't have good tissue reperfusion, we don't have good venous return, so it, den it does end up being quite edematous, and that usually takes about three to five, anywhere from three to five days for that to occur. When we're looking at a baby that has a C-section, you can see how nice and round and perfect this little tyke's head is, and that's because they don't have to go through the vaginal opening. We don't typically see much molding unless it is someone that has been pushing for a long period of time and is unable to deliver vaginally, and then they go to C-section. But typically, a C-section baby usually has a nice round little head like this. On this photo, you can see a picture of the forcep marks, and so that's where those are going to lie, right alongside of the baby. Facial bruising. The thing behind facial bruising is that typically you're going to see that with a precipitous delivery, um, and we see it with a precipitous delivery because the baby descends through the birth canal so quickly and so when you're looking at that the thing with facial bruising is we need to make sure you get that documented and then you also need to do a pulse oximeter because we don't want to confuse that with cyanosis so always if you have a doubt even if you don't have a doubt and you you feel like you strongly know that it's facial bruising it's always always a good idea to uh, get that noted get that documented so that you have all of that information available uh, on the chart transient strabismus strabismus or nystigmus this is just crossing of the eyes and it's just really common to see newborns do this just um, for you know probably the first couple of weeks after life um, their eyes just tend to cross and very common periorbital edema is you can see on this little person's eyes that it's just that swelling and a lot of times it is just due to fluid distribution and so typically what you're going to see is really about by the end of 24 hours that edema is going to be significantly reduced and improved um, just because it's that that fluid is being reabsorbed so uh, nothing to worry about there remember everything we're talking about now are normal findings subconjunctival hemorrhages are you can see in this little tyke's eyes that uh, that red mark um, reassure the parents that it's really nothing to be concerned of um, it's just due to increased intracranial pressure with the birth process typically the the subconjunctival hemorrhages will resolve within about five days so we're not going to worry about that now an abnormal discharge from the eyes yuck green yellowish nasty stuff Mm -mm, we need to call and we need to let our physician know. Epstein pearls are just protein filled cyst and they are sit kind of up here on the gum line and there's of no sub significance to them. Um, they won't harm the baby in any way. There is no treatment for the Epstein pearls. You can kind of see a little bit of white there. Um, typically it's going to resolve within one to two weeks and not have any um, adverse effects. Precocious teeth, these are not really baby's teeth and they're definitely not permanent teeth, but they are precocious teeth and so it's like a, a, another set of teeth actually. And the thing that we think about and worry about when we are looking at precocious teeth is if they're loose or if they're embedded into um, the gums. If they are embedded, such as in this case, really nothing we can do or nothing we're going to do. And um, if they are loose, then the physician will most likely just go in um, and take those out. The final picture um, is just documenting low set ears. So when you're drawing that line um, from the top of the eye straight over, you can see that these ears are low set. And typically low set ears are associated with chromosomal abnormalities, uh, especially Down syndrome.